you know, we, we've got several problems going on in our world now, such as we don't know if that's the real sun. You know, China yeah. has the artificial sun up there. And so the radiation that we're getting could be a heck of a lot worse than what we got with our natural sun. But we don't know. You know, how are we going to tell? Right. Oh. So first you need to know the sunburn is actually a type of radiation caused damage to your skin, to the top layer of your skin. Now we also have to deal with ozone depletion as well as the chemtrails and all the crap that they're throwing on us through that and the possibility of radiation. Now we have 5G radiation and they want to go to 6G and above now. So yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh. And now here we get to the problem for most people nowadays, medications. There are tons of medications that cause photosensitization, which means you're more likely to get a burn if you're on these medications. And look up your drug and see if it lists photosensitization. Because if it does, you better be careful when you go out in the sun because it can give you an awful rash or sunburn or both. You know, and a rash on top of sunburn is really not fun. This is the Wonder Network, where we discuss healthy options for humanity. I'm Michael Lane, and joining me today is my co-host, Dr. Val. Dr. Val is a retired seasoned naturopathic physician and registered nurse with over four decades of experience spanning various realms of acute care, including emergency care, intensive care, cardiac care, home health, and home hospice. How are you doing today, Dr. Val? I'm doing pretty good, Michael. How about you? I'm doing really good. I'm doing really good. So, and we're enjoying the heat. Are you enjoying the heat there? I know that's going to be kind of a little bit of our topic today. That's going to relate, you know, kind of relate to uh, the summer heat. Yeah, it's a problem, you know, and having been an emergency nurse, I can tell you that heat related illnesses are no joke. People die from that stuff. So we're going to yes. talk about yes. that, but It'll be a three-part series, but what we're starting with is sunburn, because that's the most common thing. And, you know, we, we've got several problems going on in our world now, such as we don't know if that's the real sun. You know, China yeah. has the artificial sun up there. And so the radiation that we're getting could be a heck of a lot worse than what we got with our natural sun. But we don't know. You know, how are we going to tell? Right. Oh, we have to depend on somebody else that's got the measurements and everything else. But sunburn is is kind of a lot more common this year than it has been in previous years. So we're going to start with sunburn and why. So first you need to know the sunburn is actually a type of radiation caused damage to your skin, to the top layer of your skin. So we know about UV rays. And that we want to avoid the ones that are harmful and take in the ones that are not. But there are other sources beyond the sun. There's also tanning beds. So, you know, you're not supposed to get the harmful rays in the tanning beds. I don't know if that's true now, but, um, or if it ever was. But I can tell you that I have seen a lot of people that use tanning beds um, in lieu of the sun a lot. And their skin does not look good. All right. Now, All right. I haven't seen everybody that's using them. So as a general statement, you know, it really doesn't hold any water. <laughs> You'd have to do a study. I don't know. Okay. I'm just telling you what I've seen. You could still burn in a, in a tanning bed. And I know that oh, yeah. from personal experience. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So it kind of depends on your skin type and a bunch of other stuff. And we'll go into that. So, you know, normally when you tan, it how well you tan has to do with the amount of melanin 
in your skin. That's the dark brown coloring. Freckles. You know, when you see freckles popping up and some people have, you know, beauty marks all over the place. And and uh, then, of course, we have darker skinned people who tan really easily and evenly. Some people do not tan evenly. I used to joke about how when I tan, you don't really notice it for a couple of weeks because I get, you know, 10 freckles over here and 15 freckles over there and seven freckles over there. And then yeah. eventually they all run together and I have a tan. <laughs> but it takes a while, you know. Right. It's not one of those things that, that happens very quickly. But other people don't tan at all. They just burn. <clears throat> so, you know, if you've got really fair skin, and particularly if you are in a northern climate where you don't get a lot of sun, then tanning might be, you know, not... Not in your forecast. So it just kind of depends. You know, it depends on a lot of things. Everybody is not alike, as I've said many times before. The thing is, though, that the melanin that appears in your skin is there in order to protect you from the harmful radiation of the sun. And if you don't have a lot of melanin, then, like I said, that's a problem and that will age you quickly and can really contribute to skin cancers as well. So, you know, you want more melanin, basically. And you don't want too much because you don't want to change your color permanently. And every time I say that, I think about the guy, I've forgotten his name now, the guy that wrote the book Dark Like Me. And he went in and he had melanin injections. And the doctor was completely against it, especially as he started getting darker and darker. And he said, well, how am I going to know what it feels like to be a uh, African-American person in the United States, unless I look like them. And so he purposely changed himself into a dark-skinned person. It was fascinating, really. Huh. But he did it by getting melanin injections. So can you do that? Yeah, it's not common. And, you know, you might have people that might have doctors that would say, no, I'm not going to do that. Are you crazy? Yeah. So, you know, it kind of depends. But, you know, if, if you're a really fair-skinned person and you're someplace where you're in full sun all the time, I don't know. If that was me, I'd be thinking about that for that simple reason, because it is protective. So if enough of it is present, then, you know, you're okay. You're able to tan. That's protection. And it's protection for all the tissues beneath, not just the skin itself. So sun tanning actually is an effort to increase the melanin by gradually, let me say that again, gradually exposing yourself longer with each session. Now, the problem is that if you do it at the wrong time of day and the wrong angle of the sun, then you're going to get a sunburn. And a sunburn is a first degree burn. Okay, that's an actual burn. That's where the skin is red. And it's usually dry, not blistered. Blistering is second degree burn. And it can come from any kind of a heat source. You know, this is a thermal reaction that's happening. So right. just like if you got burned by fire, you know, you're getting burned by distant fire with the sun. So the cause is the sunburn now. Now we get into some complicated stuff. So, you know, if you stay out in the sun too long without some kind of protection, and you don't have a lot of melanin in your skin, you're going to burn. However, dark-skinned people can also burn. So it doesn't mean they're completely protected. They'll usually get darker when they go expose themselves to the sun. But um, I had a friend years ago that was my archery partner, and and uh, he was telling me that he got sunburned. And I was like, really? He was really dark. <laughs> and and uh, he said, yeah. And he pulled down his collar and showed me. I was like, son of a gun, I didn't know that. Tell me more. And he said, well, yeah, you know, we can we can still get burned and we can still get tanned darker. And I was like, huh, I never really thought about it, you know. But yeah, so just because you're dark skin does not mean you won't burn at all. You know, it's radiation. So, you know, when you want to get a dose of radiation to get your skin that beautiful tan color, keep that in mind. Okay. All right. So direct exposure to the sun can be a problem if you go out between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. on our side of the earth. I don't know about the other side. 
but um, but for you know uh, North America, we're looking at staying out of the sun between ten and four. That's because the sun is more directly overhead during those times, and you're really going to get the intensity of the sun. So, and I can, I can tell you also, if you want a beautiful golden tan, that has to do with the latitude. So, like a lot of people, when they go to Malaysia, they're, they're really happy because they get this beautiful golden tan. And it's like, yeah, it's because of the angle of the sun and the earth and the time of day and all that kind of stuff. So um, I practiced that one year to see what I could do. And I used a sesame sunscreen. And I had the most beautiful golden tan I've ever had in my life. But I went out at 9 o'clock in the morning. And sometimes at 8 o'clock when it was really hot, I'd go out at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I absolutely made my cutoff 10 a.m. And then I would go back out in the afternoon after 4 o'clock and until about 6 o'clock. And when you do that, then the sun is hitting your skin at different angles. And so you're building up kind of different... Um, different melanin levels as you're doing that. And it will give right. you a really beautiful tan if that's what you're after. And of course, I was young then. That's what I was after. <laughs> I know, I know that, I don't uh, care. Feeling, yeah, that feeling very well, yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And, you know, I, I tried to to get my family to listen to me about this for years. And I would keep telling him, you know, you're going out to, to sit in the sun at noon. Why? Why are you doing that? You're going to burn. And, you know, a lot of times they did. And, you know, I guess I didn't listen either when I was a teenager and I was a sun goddess, you know. But, I mean, I, I have crispy crittered myself a couple times. And we're yes. going to talk about how you how you save yourself after you've done that. Because, <laughs> you know, and they're done that. Been there, and, done uh, that. Yep, yep. Yeah, and so I, I really try to avoid doing that. Also, I found out that um, I was wearing commercial sunscreens. And, you know, they tell you, oh, if you're going to be out on the lake or up in the mountain skiing or whatever, you have to use this, you know, high SPF sunscreen. I got the worst burns of my life wearing sunscreen, supposedly high SPF. And I mean really seriously, almost second-degree burns. Right. So I have found that there are other ways to protect yourself without going through that, besides the fact that it's expensive. And now, here we get to the problem for most people nowadays, medications. There are tons of medications that cause photosensitization, which means you're more likely to get a burn if you're on these medications. And this is not a list of all of them, because there's a lot. So whatever medications that you're on, look it up. You can go online, go to drugs.com. Um, there's a bunch of other ones, you know, whatever, uh, PDR. And look up your drug and see if it lists photosensitization. Because if it does, you better be careful when you go out in the sun because it can give you an awful rash or sunburn or both. You know, and a rash on top of sunburn is really not fun. Uh, so... Let's get started on this list. Antiarrhythmics. That's amiodarone, sololol, and dofetilide. Hmm. And those are the three major ones, but there are, are many others. So if you've got a heart problem and an arrhythmia, then and you're taking any of those three and possibly more, you know, look up everything on your drug to find out then you are going to be more sensitive to the sun. So you might go out for five or 10 minutes and be okay. You go past that limit and, you know, you've got a problem because now you're sensitive to it. Lots of antibiotics. So the major four are doxycycline, minocycline, ciprofloxin, and levofloxacin. And there's, again, like I said, there's more. Look them up. No, wait, there's more. There's more. <laughs> yeah. Antifungals. So itraconazole, variconazole, griseofulvin, terbinafin, fluconazole, ketoconazole are the major ones. And again, there's more. Antihypertensive medications, nifedipine, hydrazoline, hydrochlorothiazide. And yet there's more. 
antipsychotics, clopromazine, thyroidazine, and there's more of those too. And arthritis medications. And seeing as how a good portion of at least the U.S. population is uh, now considered either in the elderly portion or edging there quickly, and a lot of younger people now have arthritis, this becomes important. So mm. naproxen, peroxicam, and hydroxychloroquine, those are things that they will sensitize you. And like I said, you got to look this stuff up. You know, be proactive, take some responsibility for your own health, and look this stuff up. Okay, so those are the major medication problems. And they all start with an A, as long as I added the anti. <laughs> so please do look up your medications. Okay, the other thing that makes a difference is your skin type and phototype. Some people just burn really easy, and they know it because they've experienced it as kids. So take that in consideration. If you've got really dry skin and you're really fair, like, you know, neon white type of affair, then yes, you have to be careful. And believe it or not, some people are actually allergic to the sun. And I worked with a nurse like that years ago, and she had really super, super white skin because she could not go out in the sun at all. And if she went out, and, and this was in Las Vegas, and she oh. went out, she was completely covered. And, you know, Las Vegas is kind of like Phoenix. Lots of sun. Yep. It's hot. It's miserable during the summertime, and um, and you pretty much can't escape the sun, you know. So she would have these big wide brim hats and a scarf over that, and and she had gloves on and everything else. And so wow. I thought, boy, that, that must be so difficult. I think I think that. I would consider changing cities. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah if you're allergic to the sun, dark. yeah, Ve <laughs> Vegas is not the place place to be, and. Um, yeah, I've been there many times, but uh, yeah, you're almost like a vampire. Yeah, yeah, she had beautiful skin because she never went out into the right. sun, so there was no sun damage, but yeah, but I mean, she had to be super careful. Hmm. Okay, then the other thing is age. Now, whether you, whether you burn more as a child or more as an adult, that's eh, kind of hard to say. We usually think that children are, are kind of at risk because they want to be outside playing. Well, they used to when I was a kid. Nowadays, I don't know. I kind of think they're inside on their phones, you know, or their iPads or whatever. So, yeah, got to be careful with kids and, uh, and the elderly. Now, most of the people who are elderly that look like they're elderly with, you know, a lot of wrinkles and thickened skin and stuff, you know, they, they might be more susceptible or they might be less susceptible. Hard to say. You know, everybody's different. But age does have something to do with it. Okay, and we talked about the time of day. Now, we also have to deal with ozone depletion, as well as the chemtrails and all the crap that they're throwing on us through that, and the possibility of radiation. Now, we have 5G radiation. And they want to go to 6G and above now. So, yeah. Oh, gosh. This, this is a problem. You know, I remember when I first went to Las Vegas, they used to give a warning on the radio. Every day they would tell you about microwave radiation because Nellis Air Force is there and they were using microwave communications. And so they would tell you, oh, you know, don't stay outside for very long today because the radiation's high. Well, they... After a couple of years, they quit doing that. Now, it's not that the radiation was not high. They just didn't want people to know about it. So they quit talking about it. And I'm sure it's a heck of a lot worse now. I haven't been back there in a long time. So <laughs> I don't really know. But, you know, it, it was a concern. So with the ozone depletion in our in our skies, that means that more of the unfiltered light of the sun is going to get through, which means more of the unfiltered radiation. So could be a problem, you know, just something to think about. You know, yep. Be careful. Okay. And if you're at a high altitude, then you're going to burn more too. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Especially if you're skiing. 
So you see a lot of times skiers have the zinc oxide, you know, on the nose and sometimes on the cheeks too. And yep. then they're covered up the rest of the way pretty much because of that, because the air is thinner. That's what ozone depletion is kind of all about too. The air is thinner. Yep. So when that happens, then you're going to get more of the unfiltered light of the sun, which is radiation. And, uh, you know, if, if you're at a high altitude, you're going to notice it very quickly. I mean, you might not feel the burn on your skin as much as you would in Phoenix, for instance, but you're going to feel it later because it's not going to dissipate. It's going to get worse, you know. No, I can when you get a that. sunburn, it, it increases. So, like, by the time you notice that you're burning, then you think, well, I'll be okay. I'll get out of the sun. Well, no, no. The damage is going to continue for hours because you haven't been able to let the heat out. So you're getting increasing, increasing thermal damage because of that heat that is not dissipating. Because when you get too hot, you go inside, you get in the air conditioning, you get to go take a cold shower. And that's like the worst thing you can do. So we're going to get into that too. First, let's go with the symptoms. So symptoms of sunburn is red or reddish skin, which is hot to the touch or painful. Uh, general fatigue, because now you've engaged the immune system as well. And the immune system takes a lot of energy and it will deplete you very quickly. So you'll notice that you get really tired. You might get some mild dizziness. The skin might be tender, sore, and the skin will be warm to the touch. You might feel it internally, but you'll also feel it externally. And one of my crispy critter times... It's a long story, but I had to go to the ER for something else. I think I was going to pick up my paycheck or something. And one of the the uh, techs in the ER and I had gone out to the lake and got stuck. And so it took a long time to get back and, you know, yada, yada. But anyway, by the time we got back, I was definitely burned. And so was she. And the first thing the doctor did was come up and, and stick his hand on her, on her throat area. He <laughs> said, and press really hard and then let loose and go, oh, man, you're burned. It's like, yeah. Uh -huh. we kind of leaves that handprint there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't plan to be out that long. But, uh, you know, when you get stuck, when your vehicle's like sinking into the mud, you know, and there's nobody around, <laughs> you got to hike. That's just one of those things that happens. So now let's talk about prevention and treatment. So, of course, they tell you, oh, you must use a sunscreen. Well, now there's all kinds of studies that have been done that, shown, that have shown that commercial sunscreens are making it worse. And I can testify to that myself, you know. I mean, I, the worst burns I ever had were from commercial sunscreen that was supposed to be like SPF 30. And it was pretty awful. So what I found is if you are burned, first of all, you need to cool the body down quickly but you don't want to do it with cold water and can you guess why no can't what, what, what? i'm going to tell you why okay yeah <laughs> well what happens if you immerse yourself in a cold water bath or shower is you're closing up the pores and the blood is going away from the skin and going into your internal organs Okay. Especially the heart. So if you have heart disease, you definitely don't want to do that. You're shocking the body. Right. In in effect. And because the pores are closed, the heat can't dissipate. So you're driving that heat into your internal organs. This is a problem, especially mm -hmm. if you're really, really, really hot. You know, you want to stop the thermal damage. So what's advised is take a lukewarm bath. Or to put lukewarm cloths, you know, on your forehead or wherever you've, you're hottest, you know, put some lukewarm cloths there. And then as soon as they start to heat up, put them aside and, you know, fan yourself. The only problem with using an electric fan is that most people will feel so good, they'll just leave it on there and fall asleep. Then you're going to suffer even more because it's going to close your pores. You're not going to get up in time. 
close the pores, it'll cause you all kinds of secondary problems because of the thermal burn that's continuing internally now because you didn't let it out. So be careful, you know, slow and steady. You know, you want to wait at least 10 minutes before you get some cold relief. Okay, so you come inside, don't sit right underneath the air conditioning outflow, and don't immediately drink a bunch of cold water. You want to drink hot water. Now, think about when you go to any of the uh, any of the places other than the U.S., like you go to Mexico, you go to South America, Central America, you go into the Asian countries that are used to all of this heat. They eat a lot of peppers. What we are doing at Global Healing Institute is we're taking 25 years of research and we're putting it into a simple approach to teach people. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you even need to see clients per se. You should be your own certified natural health coach. And for your family, you can be a certified natural health coach. Because it teaches you everything you need to know about why you have different conditions, how to clean up your internal environment, how to clean up your external environment, the importance of cleansing and healing the gut, the importance of cleansing and healing the liver, the importance of getting the parasites out of your body. We're here to teach what good health means in our lives, creating a learning platform that motivates and inspires you to continue to learn the things that you're passionate about, ultimately so you can be the best coach for your client. And they eat a lot of really hot food. And so, you know, as Americans, we're usually thinking, oh, you know, give me something cold. Give me like, you know, cucumber and lemon in, in ice water. And you gulp it down, not realizing you're making it worse. So what you do instead is you go for a warm drink, you know, at least room temperature or get some hot tea. Now, the problem with peppers, like I usually tell people, eat some spicy food unless you're a type A. Because type A's do not do well with peppers. They love them, but they're not good for them. Whereas type O's can eat peppers all day. Not a problem. So your blood type makes a difference too. But, you know, you want something that's a little bit spicy. So like try ginger. Ginger is a warming spice. And so if you take a little bit of ginger tea or you kind of chew on some ginger candy, you know, the crystallized ginger. Yeah. Or you take one of the gingin type candies, you know, that will help to get your, your system open up enough to dissipate this heat. So after about 10 or 15 minutes, then you're okay to go ahead and start doing some other cooling measures. So, you know, I wouldn't start with the iced tea right away. I'd give it an hour before doing that. Again, for the simple reason that you want to get rid of the thermal burn. You want your pores open. You want to be right. sweating. Okay. That's really I've, I've, and I've heard that too. I remember hearing that even years ago and it, it goes against your psyche to want to have a, a hot drink, you know, your middle of summer, yeah. you know, well, if you want to cool down, you know, it does, it's, it's kind of, it feels like it's an oxymoron almost, you know, where you're supposed to drink something hot to cool down, not something cold. And, yeah. and it's hard to wrap your mind around that. Yeah, I know. Believe me, I know. And, uh, you know, having traveled, through Central America a bit and um, and living in the Southwest desert area for half of my life now, I can tell you that eating the hot food really does help, but you don't want it to be heavy. So whatever you want to eat, you want it to be light, but you want it to be warm, spicy, stimulating so that you can actually get that, that thermal uh, radiation out of you. And, right. you know, after after about an hour, then you can go to drinking the, the cooler liquids and things. And you want to make sure that you have electrolytes on board. 
So like a lot of people, they, they say, well, I'm drinking tons and tons of water and I, I'm still thirsty and, you know, I can't seem to keep up. And I tell them, stop doing that. You're going to kill your kidneys. You know, people have actually killed themselves by drinking too much water. Now, we need a minimum of usually about two quarts a day of some kind of fluid that started out as water so that we can actually stay hydrated enough for our body's processes. It doesn't have to be straight water. But the thing is that if you don't have the electrolytes to hold that water in, you're just overtaxing your kidneys. So the people that sit there and gulp down, you know, 16 to 20 some ounces of, of water at once, I mean, they're going to be peeing fairly quickly because right. it's going to dump through the kidneys. And if you keep doing that, then your kidneys are going to shut down. And I've had that experience too when I was hiking in Central America and we would all carry a gallon of water with us, but we didn't have electrolytes with us because we didn't think about that back then. And, you know, we're hiking and we're in the jungle and it's freaking hot and it's humid. And so you're sweating. I mean, five minutes outside, even without moving, you'd be sweating so much that your T-shirt would be soaked. Right. So imagine hiking for several miles like that. And my kidneys actually would shut down. And it would take me a day to recover. And then they would start to work again. So, you know, I, I didn't know what that was right at the time. But, you know, now I look back and go, uh, yeah, okay. I overtaxed my kidneys because it was just water. So you need some electrolytes, you know, sodium, potassium, and chloride. Salt helps and a little bit too. Even to put a little sugar. some salt in your water too. Yeah. Yeah, especially yeah, if it's, you can put some salt. Peak Himalayan yeah. or some Celtic salt. Yeah, it helps. Uh, you know, if you don't happen to, you know, get around something else. And then it's back to where we had to had working outside on construction sites that I did for so many years in the middle of summer, and you're up on the roof of a commercial building. And the heat up there would be pretty phenomenal. And uh, the roofs on commercial buildings and a lot of your high rides and stuff, it's it's um, a galvanized metal. It's called a Q decking. Mm -hmm. It's corrugated. But the idea is you got that sun beating down on it, and then it reflects up. We used to joke, yeah. you know, you, you could get a sunburn in your armpits because it would bounce yeah. off and come up underneath. But what we'd keep on hand, they had to keep water everywhere for everyone. But the other thing they had to keep was salt tablets. Yeah. On hand, yeah, for for the heat stroke and salt tablets were a big thing and that they were right next to always the, the water jug. Yeah. Yeah, they have to have that, but you can lose potassium too. I mean, normally you use, lose a lot of salt, but you can also lose potassium. So you need to have, you know, some kind of a hydration and like even just sitting at home and I'm not outside, I still need to have some kind of electrolyte stuff. And I'm I'm eating normally, you know, I eat pretty healthy. But still, you know, I keep that during the summertime because I can tell when I start drinking a lot of water and I can't quench my thirst, that's my clue that, up, oh, I need some electrolytes. Yep. And so I use different stuff. You know, there, there's all kinds of stuff you can get. You can go buy the commercial drinks like Gatorade, Refresh, et cetera. You can go buy... Um, Pedialyte. Uh, yeah, Pedialyte. You can get... Um, the powdered stuff that you can mix in your own water. Yep. And so I'll usually do different types of those because I usually always have some around. So, you know, you can go with Vitalite, LMNT, um, liquid IV. I mean, I, all this, this kind of different stuff that will help you to hydrate. And it's basically those three the sodium, potassium, and chloride, but it could also have some sugar in it. Usually the drinks have sugar. Yeah. And usually the um, the packets have some kind of, of glucose in there as well, because you might also need glucose. So, you know, these are these are things to consider, especially when you're, you know, someplace hot. And even, you know, I'm up in the mountains here, so it's not as hot as Phoenix. But we've had people that came up from other areas of the country. And they didn't eat, had their airplane trip, got here, rented a car, drove up here, still didn't eat. And then they're running around in the sun and then they pass out. 
And, you know, the first thing people try to do is get him to eat. And I'd be like, stop, don't try to get him to eat. You know, what they need is they need some hydration. And they'd be like, well, I'm drinking water. It's like, no, 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 you're you're using up your electrolytes. Yeah. So you got to get them, you know, one way or the other. One lady I had to send to the hospital, to the ER. And she said, well, I just, I just want to go back to the hotel and take a bath. And I said, if you do that, you'll die. So you need to get to the ER like right now. You need an IV. She was vomiting. Oh, so usually, yeah. When you get to the nausea and vomiting part, you better do something quick. That's serious. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, they, they plugged her up with an IV and they um, gave her anti-nausea medication. And after a while, she was able to go back to the hotel. But And she was okay the next day. But, you know, you don't want to get to that particular point. And we get into talking more about the illnesses in part two, then I'll explain more about all that and what you can do. So now you got a sunburn. Now I'm going to tell you how to relieve it quickly. And some of it's going to be gross. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> Lay it on us. If you're squeamish, um, you know, maybe you don't want to listen to this part. But I can tell you that this stuff works. And, you know, I remind everyone, I am a naturopath, okay? Naturopaths are crazy. We will do whatever <laughs> it takes to get well. We don't care how it tastes. We don't care how it feels. We're like, hey, if this is going to do it, I'll do it. And we used to all laugh at each other in naturopathic medical school because we would be doing stuff that most people would not do. So I'm going to tell you now what you can do that works, okay? First of all, avoid exposing your skin to the sun anymore. Okay, for years, I used to put a dilute apple cider vinegar all over wherever the burn was. You just flood yourself with that or spray it on and then air dry for 20 minutes at least. And then you can wash it off with lukewarm water. Rinse, no soap, okay? Right. But the thing that works the best is fresh urine. No. Okay. Yep. Put that on your skin. And uh, now, if you're really crispy crittered, you will keep the tan until the skin starts to peel. Because your skin will kind of get like leather. But it'll stop the burn. And the thing is that, you know, the, the people that do urotherapy, they don't usually get burnt when they go out in the sun. They don't use sunscreen. They just do urotherapy. So, you know, you can spray it on your skin, get a little micro sprayer, which, by the way, you have to clean out each time you use it or the particles in the urine will clog it up. But basically what you want to do is you want to spray it all over and air dry. You can either leave it on your skin and know it does not smell once it dries. And um, and go about your day and do that a couple times a day. Or you can spray it on if you're squeamish or, you know, pat it on however you need to get it on there and let it dry and then rinse it off with lukewarm water. That will help you a lot. It'll stop the sting of the sunburn very quickly, better than the apple cider vinegar. And actually, I found that with the apple cider vinegar, it made me smell like dirty gym socks. <laughs> huh. so i was like oh boy this is really not fun whereas when you do the urine it's like yeah okay it smells like urine until it dries and then it doesn't so i found that that works really well and it works better than anything else and for those of you that are squeamish and maybe you invest in a lot of different skincare products Look at your skincare products, and urea is usually listed on there because it's good for your skin. And if you're taking a lot of vitamins and supplements, it's really good for your skin. So, because you're taking more than your body needs, so you're going to pee it out. And so if you're using that on your skin, it's going to help because it's full of vitamins and minerals. Right, yeah. So, I'll yeah. Admit, okay, so, well, I admit okay. I've never heard even the apple cider vinegar part. I never heard. Oh, yeah. I, I always, yeah, aloe vera was always when it popped up in our family. Get the aloe vera on a sunburn. Yeah, it doesn't work that well. Yeah, it might work for a little bit. I mean, on, on the very first part, but again, you know, usually 
it's too cooling. And you know, when you put that on again, you're you know going to get the pores closed up because it is cooling. You right. can use that later, but I never found that that worked very well for me. So, you know, it works for some people. Like I said, everybody's different. Yep. Now, you yep. can also use anti-inflammatory medications like aspirin or ibuprofen um, or herbs. So, you know, what, what I like to do is have people figure out which anti-inflammatory herbs work for them before they get into the situation. So, like Boswellia is, is a great anti-inflammatory. Um, it's not fun to take in a tincture, but, um, but you know, it really works as an anti-inflammatory. Nettles help. Also, um, chamomile can be very soothing and lavender. So, you know, figure out what is going to work for you so that you have it in your medicine cabinet as your go-to for when you need it. And, right. you know, you can look all this stuff up online, too. You know, just put in, you know, do-it-yourself or, or homemade um, sunburn relief. And you'll find all kinds of recipes of things that have worked for other people. So experiment with it and make your own. Okay, then the other thing is that for the people, uh, for people who are doing urotherapy, which, by the way, has been around since kind of the beginning of mankind, and the animals use it themselves, um, people that use that usually stay looking younger a lot longer. I mean, really a lot longer. You know, there was a case of a guy from India who got pulled aside by the TSA at one point because they didn't believe that his passport was him, you know. And they kept saying, he's too young, he's too young, he looks like a teenager. And the guy was very frustrated. And finally, they, they determined that, yes, indeed, that was him after many hours. And they said, well, how come you look so young? And he said, well, I do urotherapy. <laughs> so internal and external. So huh. there is that. And I, I found right. myself that um, when I'm doing that, I really didn't burn. And keep in mind, I'm pretty fair skinned. And so um, I was surprised. In fact, I was trying to get a tan, and it took me a month of going out in the sun every day for like an hour at a time to even start to get a tan. So that's the best sunscreen I know. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, uh, <laughs> of course, I don't get out in the sun much, but if I were uh, back in uh, my younger days when I was, yeah, more of a sun god. Yeah, that uh, if I'd known about urotherapy back then, yeah, that would uh, I would have tried it. Yeah, you know. yeah. Well, me too, because you know I, like I said, I crispy crittered myself several times. Yeah, I have and too. Yeah, it is not fun, and it causes deep down tissue damage. And you know, like a a lot of the dermatologists, you know, you'll go in and they'll do uh, photos of what your skin looks like in the deeper layers and it looks like freckles, lots of freckles. And that's all oxidative damage. Oh. And, you know, as somebody who was out in the sun all the time from the time I was a little kid, you know, I've, I've never had that done myself because I figured, well, I think it's kind of a given that, you know, I probably have right. a lot of that going on. And then with the crispy critter episodes on top of it. Yeah. And, you know, be careful what you put on your skin when you're going out in the sun, you know, like back in, when I was a kid, everybody was using mineral oil and iodine. Yes. Now, yes. iodine's great. You know, it's it's absolutely wonderful, and most of us are deficient in it. We need iodine. But the mineral oil is not going to keep your skin from burning. It's going to make it burn more. And, you know, for some people that worked, it never worked for me. I tried it a couple times and said never again. Well, they were using uh, baby oil. Usually, I remember like the baby oil. Yeah, baby oil and iodine. Yeah, actually, yeah. I, in my faith, they they were doing it just, so just to get darker. wasn't even they, yeah. sunscreen wasn't even a, I don't know, that wasn't even a topic way back in the day. That was uh, it was all about how you know how do you get darker and nobody yeah. wanted to put sunscreen on because like no, that's going to stop you from getting a, a good tan. You know, yeah. So well, the baby they, oil they iodine right, thing, you know, yeah, they, they were they they wanted to attract the sun more, and I remember that the baby oil and iodine. I remember my 
uh, my mom doing that quite a bit back in the day. Yep. Yeah, well, I I did a lot of uh, copper tone back then, you know, and and so that kind of turns you orange. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Until you get tanned, then you get a really beautiful tan. But all those things have a lot of toxins in them, so you don't want to put that stuff on your skin. You know, so you can make your own sunscreen. You know, you can get carrot oil, um, pomegranate oil. You know, there's there's different things you can mix together that are actually good for your skin and will act as a sunscreen. And, you know, you can get zinc powder and mix a little bit of that in if you want to. So, again, look that up online. There's all kinds of recipes out there for a DIY sunscreen that are free of the chemicals that are causing cancers in the current sunscreens. Yes. So, you know, yeah. I look back and I think, oh, boy, how many gallons of this supposed sunscreen yeah. did I put on? Well, and look, there's a reason why even Hawaii's outlawed it for the reef because it's killing the reefs off. Yeah. You know, yeah. the, the ingredients of oxybenzone and I think it's uh, uh, octanoxite. There's two, two, two big ingredients, that, and that's your major ingredient, especially oxybenzone is your, in your typical sunscreens. And it, they finally figured out it was killing off the reefs, you know, because everybody was lathers up with that stuff, you know, and they're on the beaches in Hawaii. Yeah. So if it's killing off the reef, I mean, People they think it's killing off all the you know plant life and, and the fish life and everything on on the weeds. What do you think it's doing to your to you? You know, as a person, it's not good. That yeah. tells you it's not good for you either. Uh, yeah. And yeah, it, to stay away from that, you know, at the very least, find that finer mineral uh, uh, sunscreen uh, with zinc, zinc oxide, something like that. They've, there's a lot more of them out now than there used to be. I've noticed uh, because uh, it's there's been more awareness of these oxybenzones and some of the other ones, especially when Hawaii started passing those laws. I think that kind of opened some people's eyes. Well, I'll tell you, you know, I'm, I'm cheap when it comes to stuff like that. Urine's free. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. You produce it, you produce it every day. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to find. You don't have to carry any bottles around unless you want to spray, you know, but, um, uh, yeah, so all joking aside, it is crucial to take sunburn, sunburn seriously because that can increase the risk of developing serious health problems. So skin cancer is just the tip of the iceberg. You can develop heart disease if you get sunburned too much. I got a question and for you. It pops up later. Yeah, it's because of the thermal burn that you're getting inside. You know, you get overheated. The body doesn't like to be over 105 degrees. No, you know, and if your brain no. gets up to 107, they consider you brain dead. And, you know, I've I've had to take care of patients who came in with a temperature of 107 to 110. Most of them didn't make it. And in fact, we had a death here in Phoenix, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, a nine-year-old kid. Ooh. You know, they were hiking in Phoenix. And I don't, I think they were on South Mountain in Phoenix. And, you know, those those trails don't have any shade. You know, you're yeah. going up a mountain with no shade. It's all arid. And, yeah, you're out in you the know, desert. They, you're out in the desert. Yeah. And so even if you're carrying water, it's not enough. You know, you got to cool the person down. So there's a lot of things you can do. And we're going to talk about that when we get into part two, which you do for various um, stages. We're going to talk about heat stroke and heat exhaustion and the differences, as well as prickly rash. So, you know, we'll get into all those treatments later. But basically, with sunburn, just realize that's a first-degree burn. And if it blisters, it's a second-degree burn, which means it's deeper into the tissues. I've had that. Okay. I had one time. One time, yeah. my whole back, I blistered up. Ooh. And matter of fact, it was in Hawaii. We were there on vacation. And luckily, I was in my youth, you know, took, I didn't, it came on so quick, but I, it was from, a, I was sitting out in the ocean a lot on a surfboard and uh, surfing. So you get that reflection off the water. So it wasn't, yep. you know, and you're just sitting there, you're sitting there a lot and, you know, waiting for waves. And I didn't, I don't know, I didn't even think about it. We were probably out there for hours. And, yeah. uh, and then all of a sudden, I just feel that evening, my back started to blister up with these. They're water blisters. 
It's like, what the heck is, what the heck is this? Yeah. You know, and we ended up going to uh, some kind of urgent care or something there. And it's like, like, yeah, you pretty much. Yeah. You just fried the crap out of your skin, dude. <laughs> yeah. And my whole yeah. back just had all these little miniature water blisters all over. And I was like, holy cow. And it was just from one afternoon sitting on the surfboard all afternoon out in the ocean. Yeah. Yep. It can happen very quickly. And nowadays, yep. like I said, you know, all joking aside, you know, if we're looking at a a sun that's not natural now, then you don't know what kind of radiation you're getting. But I remember last year when I was sitting out in the sun, I was like, this is not normal. I'm feeling the burn like in the first five minutes. And it was only right. like 80 degrees. That's not normal. No. So, no. you know, at that point, I was like, I don't know what's up with the sun, but, you know, this this is bad. It feels like I was irradiated. And, hmm. you know, I, I forget wearing black. You know, if you're wearing a black T-shirt and you go out there. Right. Oof, boy, you know, you get burned through the T-shirt. So, yeah. So, anyway, people, be careful with your skin. Yeah. And yeah, it does regenerate fairly quickly, but you know, there's there's a point when the body can't regenerate anymore. And if yeah, that like, happens, then you're out of luck. Yeah. Like, yeah, don't get your black your back all blistered up like I did. <laughs> not yeah, not smart. Not, not a, yeah, not a good thing to do. I do have I do got a question to throw at you that's been going okay. around quite a bit uh, on certain uh, uh social media sites. Cause and and you could tell you know back in the day, we didn't wear sunglasses as much. You know, we'd go to the beach. We're younger. Sunglasses have become such a big part of our society as time has gone on. Uh, not just for you know eye protection from the sun, but you know it's a fashion statement. Blah blah blah. So some people have come out and said that 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 wearing sunglasses can actually cause you your skin to burn faster, more easily burn. Because you're shutting off your body's sensory perception uh, when the sun, because when the sun comes in and hits your pupils, it triggers some of that melanonin protection, your natural skin protection in you. When you put mm -hmm. on sunglasses, you take that away. Then your natural body's resistance to sun uh, goes away because you're blocking up uh, that trigger that the sunlight comes into your pu eye pupils to trigger that off. I don't know if you've heard anything about that. Uh, no, but I would think that it has a little bit to do with it, but it's not everything to do with it. Right. And, right. you know, if, if you have light eyes, you're more sensitive to the sun anyway. And, you know, light eyes, like blue eyes, light blue eyes. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. Eyes, okay. Then um, you're going to be more sensitive to the sun. You're usually going to be fair skinned, but not always. So, you know, at, at that point, you know, should you be wearing sunglasses? I don't know. I mean, you know, the eye, eye doctors usually say yes. I say no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't wear sunglasses, and um, I I used to. But what sunglasses do is they they are preventing some of the healing rays of the sun from hitting your eyes. And so it's for that reason, like I used to do sun gazing. I'm not doing it now because right. I noticed the difference in the sun. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. You know, I need to look into it more. I just need more time in the day, you know, <laughs> to look into all these things. But the um, the rays of the sun are not just UVA, UVB, you know. There are a lot of different frequencies that we get from the sun. Right. And so the best thing is to, you know, get up as the sun is rising and look at the sun at that point and, you know, allow the photons to enter your body. And then as you go throughout the day, you know, if you don't have sunglasses on, you're going to get the different varieties of frequencies the sun is actually sending us. Right. If it's our real sun. So, you know, who knows? But, yeah, I don't wear sunglasses, which is really a pity. I have tons of them. 
<laughs> Most people Every once do. In a while yeah. I might wear them. You know, it depends you know, on where I'm going. But, I have to wear uh, if, if I'm driving, I got to have them. You know, that yeah. that's a safety thing, you know. Um but I could see when when I'm outside uh hiking or working out in the yard or even going to the beach or anything like that, I've gotten to where I wear I've started wearing them less. Um the only time it's it's I got to do it all the time is if I'm I'm behind the wheel. Uh then I got to have my sunglasses on. Yeah, well, then you got a lot of glare off of other things. Exactly. Like yeah, too. Uh, yeah. That for me, it's a safety thing. Yeah, I yeah. I, I have to be able. To, I want to be able to see the road and see the yeah. other cars around me a little better. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, that's all I know about it. Okay. I don't know all everything. Right. I just sound like I do. <laughs> no, that's right, and that's what we're doing. You know, this is a discussion. Yeah. There's a lot of things out there, so I brought up you know the sunglass thing. I've seen that going around here recently for the past couple of years of, you know, of it, uh, whether it's true or not, don't really know, haven't seen anything solid on it, but it's getting, uh, I, I'm seeing it more and more of, as far as sunglasses relating to, uh, yeah, your skin sensitivity to the sun. And I like the idea, like you said, there's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot, the sun isn't, I mean, we need the sun. There's a lot of good yeah. Uh, frequency and rays coming out of that sun that we need, and yeah. uh, and uh, the it coming in through our eyes naturally. You know, <laughs> be careful, folks. I'm not saying just go out there and stare at the sun when it's you know high noon. Um, you yeah. know, even when you sun gaze, you could do, you got to do it early morning or late evening when it's on the horizon. Uh, so you know, but uh, and and there again, you brought up a good point. You know, how good is that sun gazing? So when you get it, that sun is down to a point where it's not harmful to your eyes when it's on the horizon, uh, mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of good benefits that come out of sun gazing. So, well, I found out in the, uh, what was it? One of the wars, World War II or the Korean War, I don't remember, but um, they had a bunch of prisoners that they were forcing to stand with their eyes open. You know, looking at the sun directly for hours a day. I think I've heard that. And yeah. it didn't, yeah, they wanted them to lose their sight, right. but they didn't. They all improved. And the guys that used to have to wear glasses no longer needed glasses. Huh. So, huh. yeah, that was quite interesting. And, uh, you know, that my only question is, is that our real sun or is that the Chinese sun? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I can tell you the radiation feels different. Right. You know, it no longer feels healing. So I don't know. You know, I, I really have no way of, of knowing that. I have my own suppositions about it, of course. But, um, you know, meanwhile, I just try to, to uh, you know, get what is the most healthy for me. So I do spend a little time in the sun, but, you know, I'm careful. I don't want to get crispy crittered ever again. Yeah, and if it, if it is an artificial sun, anything artificial we know is not good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anything. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, what are what are we getting? What kind of radiation are we yeah, actually getting so. from that? That's the question. Anyway, so when we do part two, we'll talk about how to deal with the, the heat emergencies. And it's a good time since it's summer here. And, you know, the United States has just been hit with the biggest heat wave, I think, that we've ever had. And uh, apparently it's going to continue for a while. Yeah, we're so, supposed to hit 104 here today. So it's yeah. roaring away. Yeah. So be careful out there. All righty, guys. That's our discussion for part one on uh, sun yeah. issues and more coming up. So for the Wonder Network, where we discuss healthy options for humanity, this is Michael Lane with Dr. Val, and we'll see you next time.